Why is it that this sublime pagan wisdom, although it contained no moral impulse, was able, for example, in ancient Greece, to come to flower in such beauty of art and grandeur of philosophy? If we were to go much farther back, to a time more than three thousand years before the Christian era, we should find that together with the promptings of wisdom there did come a moral impulse, that the moral principles, the ethics needed by these men of old were contained in this wisdom. But a special ethos, a specific moral impulse such as came with Christianity was not an integral part of paganism. Why was this? It was because through the millennia directly preceding Christianity, this pagan wisdom was inspired from a place far away in Asia, inspired by a remarkable being who had been incarnated in the distant East in the third millennium before Christ, namely Lucifer. To the many things we have learned about the evolution of humanity, this knowledge too must be added, that just as there was the incarnation which culminated in Golgotha, the incarnation of Christ in the man Jesus of Nazareth, there was an actual incarnation of Lucifer in far-off Asia in the third millennium BCE. And the source of inspiration for much ancient culture was what can be only be described as an earthly incarnation of Lucifer in a man of flesh and blood. Even Christianity, even the mystery of Golgotha as enacted among men, was understood at first by the only means then available, namely the old Luciferic wisdom. The one-sidedness of the Gnosis, for all its amazing profundity, stems from the influence that had spread from this Lucifer incarnation over the whole of the ancient world. The significance of the mystery of Golgotha cannot be fully grasped without the knowledge that rather less than three thousand years previously there had been the incarnation of Lucifer. In order that the Luciferic inspiration might be lifted away from its one-sidedness, there came the incarnation of Christ, and with it the impulse for the education and development of European civilization and its American offshoot. But since the middle of the 15th century, since the impulse for the development of individuality, of personality, has been at work, this phase of evolution has also contained within it certain forces whereby preparation is being made for the incarnation of another supersensible being. Just as there was an incarnation of Lucifer in the flesh and an incarnation of Christ in the flesh, so before only a part of the third millennium of the post-Christian era has elapsed, there will be in the West an actual incarnation of Araman, Araman in the flesh. Humanity on earth cannot escape this incarnation of Araman. It will come inevitably. But what matters is that men shall find the right vantage point from which to confront it. Foster said, quote, Such symbolically is the progress and mode of achievement for every human soul, such has been the path trodden by all the saviors of the race, from darkness to light all must go. He must learn that the experience is the only thing that can fit him to join the ranks of the master masons of the universe and carry on the eternal quest in company with all brothers. This is the revelation which the passage of the candidate through all the degrees conveys. Subtle and elusive indications are given also of that organized and intelligent activity which is carried on by that grand lodge of master masons who have for ages watched over humanity and guided men steadily in the way of light. The whole fabric of masonry may be regarded as the externalization of that inner spiritual group whose members down the ages have been custodians of the plan. End quote. Remember the plan? We've discussed it at length. It's also known as the great work, the lost word, etc., etc., etc. 
Foster Bailey, in his book, pages 21 and 22. Next, he writes that these master masons are called by many names, such as Christ and his church. They can be known by others as the masters of the wisdom, the great white brotherhood, the dispensers of light, the builders. Then he adds, quote, they are therefore sometimes known as the Illuminati. <laughs> There's the admission. And there are many more that I've quoted on this broadcast. And yet I still get letters from people saying the Illuminati is an illusion. They don't really exist. Well, here's a member. Who tells you that they do? He says they are the rishis of the oriental philosophy, the builders of the occult tradition. Stage by stage, they assist at the unfolding of the consciousness of the candidate until the time comes when he can enter into light and in his turn become a light bearer, one of the Illuminati who can assist the Lodge on high in bringing humanity to light, end quote. Foster Bailey also says that participating in this great work as part of a greater initiation, the Luciferic initiation that Benjamin Krim says will take place in Masonic Lodges, will take one on to his own godhood, quote, the rites, ceremonies, and initiations of masonry may be regarded and are so regarded by many as being faint representations and symbolic rehearsals of those major spiritual initiations through which every human being must pass before achieving his goal of manifested divinity and can enter finally within the veil, end quote. If he perfects the temple and finds the philosopher's stone, which is their metaphor for the perfection of the soul, will, in fact, become God. It's the old Gnosticism of ancient times. Another tendency in modern life of benefit to Araman in preparing his incarnation is all that is so clearly in evidence in nationalism. Whatever can separate men into groups, whatever can alienate them from mutual understanding the whole world over and drive wedges between them, strengthens Araman's impulse. Future uncertain, 
but certainly slight. Look at the faces, listen to the bells. It's hard to believe we need a place called hell.